Hey everybody and welcome back to To Be Like Christ for our Bible study. We are picking up in Luke chapter 8, verse not 16. I don't know why I'm on this page. Verse 19. Nope, that's also wrong. Verse 22. Maybe I should figure out what we're, <laughs> what we're talking about before I teach this. I did prepare for this, I promise. Well, I hope everyone's having a good day. It's like rainy and cloudy and kind of cold here today. It's like a napping kind of a day, but... I haven't uh, given into the napping yet. Let's talk about these. I'm on a bit of a time crunch today, so I'll talk fast and not waste as much time as usual. This is about Jesus walking, or Jesus calming the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Verse 22 through 25. One day he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us cross to the other side of the lake. And so they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came on the lake, and they were filled with water and, and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him? There's a good example here about the way that the gospel writers don't always write um, e exactly the same. That was never their intention, and the events are not always written in chronological order. So in Matthew's gospel, this uh, Jesus teaches in parables, like the parable of the sower that we just talked about. Um, he talked about that in chapter 13, but he talks about Jesus calming the storm in chapter 8. And it's in kind of different order in some of the other gospels as well. You might think, oh, is that a problem? Is it like a contradiction or something? And it, it's not. And I just wanted to point this out just in case anyone was tempted to think that because the gospel writers, there was no rule that you had to write about Jesus's life chronologically. And additionally, none of them were claiming to write a chronological account of Jesus's life. They included certain stories in certain places, perhaps because it better tailored to the message that they were sending to their audience or because that's the... the <laughs> the order that they remember them in, we don't exactly know, but it's not in any way a contradiction or a problem. There's no claims to be writing in chronological order from the gospel writers. But it is something worth noting. Jesus wanted to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and so he got into a boat with his, his apostles, and he went. And it might have been like Peter's, Peter and Andrew's boat, because they were fishermen. James and John were also fishermen, so Seems likely that it was probably one of their boats. There was actually a fishing vessel from the first century found in the Sea of Galilee during a drought in 1986. And I have a photo in your notes. I don't know how well you can see that or if the camera will focus on it, but actually I should check my focus on my camera. Um, oh, okay. Or continuous autofocus, that's what I wanted. <laughs> Sometimes, I get it wrong and it's bad. But anyway, if you don't have the notes, there are links to this file and this book down in the description. So this boat was about 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and it's currently in a museum called the Yeagle Allen Museum. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, but... So it was probably something very similar. 27 feet long, you know, you could fit 12 guys in that, 13. And during the trip to the other side of the sea, this windstorm came up. I was reading a geographic commentary on the Gospels, and it talks about how this is somewhat of a common occurrence on the Sea of Galilee. This wind can pick up very quickly, and it comes off of the, like the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee. There's an area there called the Golan Heights. And the wind comes off the Golan Heights and then dips down into the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is somewhat of like a little bowl. And so the wind gets you know, stirred around in there. I have a map in the notes also showing the area of the Golan Heights. It's in the highlighted square northeast of Galilee. But this must have been a pretty nasty storm because James, John, Peter, and Andrew, I mean, they were fishermen. They made their living on the sea. Maybe they didn't cross the sea every day, but they were out on the sea and they were very familiar with the Sea of Galilee and the weather patterns and things, but this one was apparently really, really nasty. And Jesus was just asleep on 
on the boat like nothing was going on. <laughs> and the apostles, they were terrified. It says that there was water coming into the boat and they thought that they were going to go down with this thing in the, the middle of the sea. So they woke Jesus up in fear and in hopes that he might be able to do something or at least contribute and help them. They said, Master, Master, we are perishing. So Jesus wakes up. He first looks at the winds and the waves and he rebukes them like they can hear him, you know, like they understand his words. He rebukes them and miraculously they do hear his words and everything becomes calm. And then he turns back to his apostles and he rebukes them for their lack of faith. And I have several applications from this story that I'd like to take a look at. Uh, and the first one is, I, I think that this storm and wave situation, this, this, the storm and the sea, they beautifully illustrate a trial, a temptation that I think almost all Christians are gonna face during their lives. And that is the temptation to think that Jesus has forgotten about us or that God has forgotten about us. Sometimes when we get into trouble and we pray and we don't see an immediate answer, the temptation is to think, well, why isn't God listening to me? Where is God in my trial? Where is God in my struggle? Doesn't he care about my financial problems or doesn't he care about my health problems or my family problems? I'm not getting any answer from him. He must be asleep on me. And like the apostles, they can't understand why Jesus is sleeping on them. It's like he doesn't really care about their suffering and the storms in their lives. But the conclusion of this story lays down a principle that's also confirmed other places in the Bible, and that is that Jesus is never unaware of our suffering. He's never unaware of our circumstances. He will deliver us faithfully from the storms of life. And as with the apostles, God's deliverance will help our weak faith by giving us a chance to marvel at the way that God helps us out of those bad situations. It's a faith-refining process that sometimes God is putting us through. Another application. You notice how the, how the apostles cried out and they said to Jesus, Save us, Master, Master, we are perishing. But then they're shocked when he actually gets up and does it. <laughs> this is probably not the way that we want to pray. James, in the first chapter of the book of James, mentions that we ought to pray with faith having confidence that God is able to do anything. I mean, the winds and the waves understand what Jesus is saying. And if he can control even the winds of the waves, the apostles concluded that, you know, this guy is something special. And that's true. The, the, the conclusion that they drew was correct. And so when we pray, we ought to pray in confidence, knowing that God can do whatever he wants. He can get us out of that situation however he desires to do it and to have faith. It would be better to be shocked if God didn't come through because that never happens. So, okay, application number three. The apostles were in this situation, why? Is it because they had like done something wrong and this was punishment for their sins or because they were in trouble? No, the reason that the apostles were in this situation is because they were being obedient to Jesus. And I thought that that was really interesting. Jesus told them to get into the boat and cross to the other side. And guess what Jesus also Guess what he knew? He knew that the storm was coming. He knew the trials that they were going to face out on the water. And yet he still told them to get in, and they obediently did so, and they went with Jesus. And I think that's an important lesson. It does tell us a little bit that difficulties and suffering and trials in our life are not always the result of our sin or a consequence of our sin or the sins of somebody else. Sometimes, uh, they are God leading us into a difficult situation in order to refine us, to make us better, to develop our faith. And that was, that's what was going on here. Application number four comes from Psalm 23, verses 1 and 2. You may have heard this psalm before. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. It's a very comforting verse. Jesus is going to lead me by still waters and green pastures. Sounds very nice, very relaxing, right? And wait a second. I thought the shepherd was supposed to do that, not lead his people into a raging storm where there is anything but still waters. And there's no green pasture to be seen, and that's why you're fearful of drowning. 
wasn't God promising us in Psalm 23 that he was going to make our way easy for us and make our lives comfortable? I think the answer to that is no. Psalm 23 is not so much about where God leads us as it is the shepherd who's doing the leading and his ability to keep us safe and give us peace and guard our way. It's interesting that Jesus, the shepherd here, uh, he's in the boat doing what? Laying down sleeping. <laughs> it, it's as if he is by still waters uh, laying down on the green pasture. But his disciples are terrified out of their mind. <clears throat> Jesus was almost certainly getting hit by waves and water, and there must have been a significant amount of wind noise. But the shepherd slept while the others perceived danger. The shepherd knew better than the others, though, that there wasn't actually any real danger. So it was, Jesus wasn't a bad shepherd. They just didn't trust him. They weren't in any danger. That ship wasn't sinking. God's plan wasn't going to be thwarted by a, a little windstorm out in the Mediterranean or the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. After all of these thousands of years of God bringing this plan about, working through all different circumstances to do it, there was no real danger here. <clears throat> the apostles' perception was incorrect. They should have known that if the shepherd was sleeping, they could sleep as well. Now, does that have any application for our lives? I think, yeah, it definitely does, because we are often in kind of the same situation as the apostles, lacking faith in the trials of our lives, thinking that perhaps the shepherd has led me down the wrong path and now I'm in danger. No, as long as we're following the shepherd, that's not the case. He has us secure in whatever situation we're in. And then finally, the last application. I find it interesting that Jesus calmed the storm because, as we just mentioned, there wasn't any real danger. The danger only existed in the imagination of the apostles. They believed in a danger that wasn't real. Satan was able to convince them that Jesus wasn't in control, right? Uh, that potentially they could be sinking out here. But what we know and, and what Jesus proves is that anything that God holds securely in his hand, Satan can't threaten. Or he can threaten, but he can't bring anything to fruition that God doesn't want to happen, right? Um, Satan doesn't have any power to overrule God, so he can threaten, but his threats are empty. And unfortunately, a lot of times, we buy in to Satan's empty threats. But anyway, why did Jesus calm the storm? Why did he pull them out of this situation? Well, perhaps God has, has done this for you in the past. I know that he's done it for me. You're trying to live for God and to do what's right, but there's some circumstance in your life that is making you anxious, giving you a, a hard time, run for your money. Your mind perceives some danger, that that danger perhaps might overcome you. But it's not going to overcome you if God's promises are true. But rather than allowing us or forcing us to remain in that situation with that perceived danger, that imaginary danger, uh, and, and to continue to allow that thing to plague us, sometimes God takes it away and gives us a season of ease and peace again. Now, why would God do that? Well, perhaps so that like the apostles, we can look back at this situation or our situation and realize that God had everything under control all along. We get those moments of reprieve, hopefully, so that we'll meditate on what is past and what God has done for us, the precedent of his faithfulness. Realize that, wow, you know, all of my anxieties, they were kind of pointless, that the shepherd wasn't off guard. So the next time that we encounter some threat from Satan, It'll be easier for us to suppress our anxieties, knowing the precedent of God's faithfulness. No doubt, no doubt the apostles looked back on this event later on in their lives, in their ministry, when they encountered some danger and realized that, well, and it, it, it emboldened them to go forward knowing that the shepherd was still with them. This was, I mean, they would not have forgotten this. And I think the intention of God is that we don't forget the times that he brings us through tough situations either. I found this true 
well, I found this, uh, this lesson, this application to be true in my own life. <clears throat> the older I get, the longer my list gets of times that God has brought me through difficult situations. We need to remind ourselves of all the times in the past that God has calmed the storms in our life. Make a list if you have to. And we need to preach God's past faithfulness to ourselves in order to starve the legitimacy of our anxieties. How many times has God calmed storms in your past? Let that be the statistic that fills your mind the next time the winds and the waves and the storms try to fill it with anxieties and fear. Well, and that should do it for us today. Just uh, tackling that one story, we're going to talk about Jesus meeting a man who was demon-possessed in the next section, verse 26 and 27. It's Friday, though, so this is the last video of the week. I hope you all have a great weekend, and we will see each other again if God wants it to happen on Monday. See you later.